in this lesson, we want to look at some probability word problems. So at some point in your algebra course or your pre-calculus course, you're going to come across a small section on probability. And I just want to go through some basic word problems that you're going to see and talk about how we can solve these guys. So I'm just going to jump right in. I'll just kind of explain things as we go. It's a very, very easy topic overall. So Jason flips a coin and then rolls a six-sided die. What is the probability that the coin lands heads up and, okay, I'm going to highlight that, and the die shows an even number? Okay, so when you deal with these problems, you're going to have problems that say and, so some event occurs and some other event occurs. In this case, one event is flipping a coin and him getting a heads up, and the other event is rolling a die and getting an even number, so a two, a four, or a six. Okay, when you hear the word and, you need to be thinking about multiplication. So I would take and use this formula. The probability of some event A and some event B happening, okay, in this case, we'd say the coin landing heads up and also the die showing an even number, is equal to the probability of this event A happening times the probability of this event B happening, okay? Now, this is given the fact that they are independent events, meaning the first event does not impact the result of the second event in any way, shape, or form, okay? If he flips a coin, that does not impact the result of rolling a six-sided die, okay? So these are independent events. We can just use this formula as it's given. So what we want to do here is just think about the fact that the probability for flipping a coin and getting a heads up is going to be what? It's going to be a half or 50%. We all know this because we've thought about that throughout life at some point, flipping a coin saying, hey, my odds are 50-50. Well, how do we show this mathematically? Where does that 50-50 or the 50% come from? Well, essentially what you do is you think about the number of different ways that you can get an outcome from flipping a coin. Well, you can basically get a heads up or a tails up. Right, so there's two possibilities. So I'll put that in the denominator. And then think about what you're looking for. What's the result? Well, I want a heads up, and that can only happen one way, right? So I would put that number in the numerator. Okay, and as we do more of these, this will make more sense. But essentially, this is the formula you want to use. That's where one half comes from. This is basically the number of favorable outcomes. In this case, a favorable outcome would be landing heads up over the total number of possible outcomes. And the possible outcomes here would be landing heads up or landing tails up. Okay, so I know that's one half. So let's just say that this satisfies the probability of event A. Now, what about the probability of event B? Let's say that's the die showing an even number. Well, with a die, if it's six-sided, it can land on a one. Let me just kind of write this down here in a different color. A one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or six. So we know that the two is an even number, the four and the six. Okay, so two, four, and six, those are even numbers. So how many different favorable outcomes can I have? Well, I have one, two, three favorable outcomes that are possible out of a total of six. So I would put three over six, which you can simplify to one half. Okay, and then you just multiply the two together. And let me just kind of erase this. You multiply the two together and you get one fourth. Okay, now you can leave it as a fraction and say it's one fourth of the probability, or you can convert it to a decimal, which is 0.25, and then to a percentage and say it's 25%. Okay, so essentially the probability of this Jason guy flipping a coin and getting a heads up and also taking a die and rolling it and getting an even number is 25%. Okay. Let's look at a slightly more challenging problem. And in this case, we're going to have dependent events. So Allison, a teacher out of middle school, has five boys and six girls in her class. Allison randomly selects three different students to walk up and give a presentation. Once the presentation is over, the student will leave for the day. What is the probability that the first student is a boy, the second student is a girl, and the third student is also a girl? So you see the problem here is that these events are not independent, okay? Once she picks a student and we're looking for her to pick a boy first, okay? Then the next time we want her to pick a girl and then the next time we want her to pick a girl, but each time she's picking, the class size is changing, right? So the number of boys is changing, the number of girls is changing, whatever it is in that scenario, but the class size is constantly changing so we have to readjust our probability, okay? So we're still going to think about multiplying the probabilities together. 
But you use a different formula for this. If it was just two things, here it's three, but let's say it was two things. So the probability of A and B, okay, if these guys are dependent, and it's just two, it would be the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has happened, okay? So given that A has happened, what's the probability of B happening? Okay, and in this case, we're going to adjust it because we have one more thing to consider because now we're thinking about the probability that the first student is a boy. Okay, so that happens. Then the probability that the next student is a girl. Okay, and then the probability that the third student is also a girl. So again, you have and, so you're thinking about multiplication. Okay, so what is the probability on the first grab that that student is a boy? Well, there's going to be five boys. Okay, so there's five possible choices in there that's going to be boys out of a total of five plus six is 11, 11 total students. So the first number we're looking at is, I'm just going to write this down here, five over 11. And I'm just going to put this as the first, okay? So the second is going to be what? Well, if I go back up, I know that the student leaves, he can't be rechosen now, and there's going to now be what? Well, there's one less boy, so there's four boys, and there's the same number of girls, but the total number in the class now is four plus six or 10. Okay, so if I think about picking a girl now, it's going to be six girls out of a 10 student classroom. Okay, let me just erase this. So let's go down here and put that now it's six over 10. Okay, so this is second, you'd say. And now what's gonna happen for the third choice when we go back up? Well, now there's, let me just kind of scratch this out again, say this is four this is going to go down to five. There's a total of nine students and there's five girls. So there's five over nine. Okay, let me just erase this again. And now I'll say this is five over nine and this is going to be the third pick, okay? So the probability of picking a boy on the first run is five over 11. Then given the fact that that event has already happened, now there's a six over 10 probability of picking a girl. Now, given the fact that both of those events happened, the probability on the third pick that it's a girl is five over nine. Okay, so again, to get the final probability or the probability that all these events happen, so this and, she picks the first student as a boy and she picks the second student as a girl and she picks the third student as a girl, it's gonna be the product of these probabilities. So before we multiply, notice you can cancel this with this and get a two here. And then six divided by two would be three and then nine divided by three would be three. Okay, so I'm gonna put a one here. And basically what you'd have is five times one or five over 11 times three, which is 33. So you have five over 33, which is the probability of picking a boy, then a girl, then a girl. All right, so now let's talk about some word problems that involve this or. So when event A happens or an event B happens. So with this, we're going to be adding now. So when you hear and, you gotta be thinking about multiplication. When you hear or, you've gotta be thinking about adding, okay? But there's a trick to this, and let me just kind of go through this with this problem. So Katie has six nickels and seven dimes in her pocket. Five of the nickels and one of the dimes are Canadian. The others are from the US. Suppose Katie randomly selects a coin from her pocket. What is the probability that it is a dime or is from the US? This is the key word here, the or, okay? So what you wanna be thinking about is the probability of some event A happening or some event B happening is the probability of the event A happening plus the probability of the event B happening minus, okay, this is important, minus the probability of A and B happening, okay? And I know a lot of people use set notation there, so you might see this as well, okay? So the intersection of A and B. However you want to write it, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to stick to writing and. I think that's a little bit easier for us to understand. Okay. In this particular case, we don't have something known as mutually exclusive events. Mutually exclusive events are two events that can never occur simultaneously. So in this particular case, we don't have that because it says, what is the probability that it is a dime or is from the U.S.? Well, we have dimes that are also from the U.S., so we have to use this full formula, okay? If we didn't have dimes from the U.S., we could knock this part out, okay? This is going to take out the double counting. So let's go through real quick and think about what's the probability that it's a dime. 
Well, we know that she has six nickels and seven dimes. Okay, well, six plus seven is 13. So 13 coins overall, seven of them are dimes. So the probability of having a dime is seven over 13. Then plus, what's the probability, okay, that the coin is from the U.S., meaning it's not Canadian? Well, it tells you that five of the nickels and one of the dimes are Canadian. So six out of the 13 coins are Canadian. So seven out of the 13 are American or U.S. currency. So 7 over 13. 7 plus 7 is 14. 14 over 13 is a number larger than 1. When we deal with probabilities, it's either 0, okay, meaning it's not going to happen, up to and including 1. 1 means it's certain to happen. Anything in between means it may or may not happen. Okay, but you can't get a probability less than zero or greater than one. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so that would be a red flag if you forgot to subtract this out. So all we need to do to fix this is subtract out the probability of A and B occurring. Okay, so how many dimes that we have that are also from the U.S.? Well, let's think about that. We know that there are seven dimes in her pocket. Okay, total of seven. And it says that five of the nickels and one of the dimes are Canadian. So that means that six of the dimes are from the U.S., okay? So that tells me that I need to subtract away six over 13, right? Because six of the dimes are from the U.S. So if I crank this out now, I get seven plus seven, which is 14, and then 14 minus six, which is eight. So I get a result of eight over 13. So that's going to be the probability that she picks a coin that's going to be a dime or it's from the U.S. Okay, let's look at another example of this. And now we're going to see mutually exclusive events. So Beth has a fruit basket which contains four apples, four peaches, and five pears. If she randomly selects a piece of fruit, what is the probability that it is an apple or a peach? Again, when you see this keyword or, you're thinking about addition, okay? But in this particular case, you don't need that full formula, okay? Because... It's not possible for her to select something that's an apple and a peach at the same time. So again, when you think about the probability of some event A happening or some event B happening, it's the probability of A plus the probability of B and then minus the probability of A and B occurring. And I didn't write my A there. So A and B. Well, in this particular case, you can get rid of this because it's going to be zero. Again, you cannot have a piece of fruit that's an apple and a peach at the same time. Maybe they're working on that. I'm not sure. But in this scenario, it's not possible. So we just think about the probability of A. Let's say that's where she selects an apple. Well, there's four apples out of a total of four plus four plus five. Four plus four is eight. Eight plus five is 13. So the total of four over 13, okay, that's going to be your probability of picking an apple. Then plus, what's the probability of picking a peach? Well, again, it's four over 13. So all I have to do is just sum these and I get eight over 13. All right, so let's wrap up the lesson by looking at an example where we use our binomial probability formula. So the desks in a classroom are organized into four rows and four columns. Each day, the teacher randomly assigns you to a desk. You may be assigned to the same desk more than once. Over the course of five days, what is the probability that you are assigned to a desk in the front row exactly three times? Okay. So if you are dealing with a scenario such as this, where you have repeated independent trials, okay, so this is independent because every day you're randomly assigned to a desk and you can sit where you've sat before. And the outcome in each trial is either a success, meaning in this case, you will get assigned to the front row or a failure, okay? So if you wanna find the probability of our successes in N trials, you can use this formula. So let me write this down here. And we'll come back up in a minute. So N choose R, okay, we remember that. And then times P raised to the power of R. P is the probability of a success. So on a single day, what's the probability of you getting seated in the front row? I'll get to that in a second. Then times one minus this P raised to the power of N minus R. So N is the number of trials. So if we go back up, we know that this is going to happen for five days. So over the course of five days, so N is five, and the number of successes we're looking for is R, right? So three times is we're looking for that number to happen. So N is five, N is five, and R is three, okay? So you're just plugging things in. So you have five and three, okay? Then P is the probability of a success on any given day. Well, if we go back, 
we know that there's a total of 16 deaths, right? Four rows and four columns, four times four is 16. So in the front row, you're going to have four deaths. So that means you have a four over 16 or one fourth or 25% probability of getting seated in the front row on any given day. So we're going to put a one fourth here. You could use a decimal if you want, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be the same result in the end. R again is three. And then one minus one fourth. If you're using a fraction, you would do four fourths minus one fourth, which is three fourths. And then raise the power of n, which is five, minus r, which is three. So this is gonna be squared, okay? So once you have this set up, you can just erase this and crank this out. So on a calculator, five choose three is going to be 10. Then if we think about one fourth cubed, that's gonna be one over four cubed is 64. Then if we think about three fourths squared, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. Can I cancel anything before I multiply? I can just get rid of this, I don't need it anymore. Can I cancel anything? Well, yeah, I can cancel a factor of two here and here. So this would be 32, and this would be five. So five times nine is 45 over, what is 32 times 16? That's gonna be 512. So 45 over 512, that's gonna be your probability of getting seated in the front row exactly three days out of a total of five days.